Today, roughly half of all Christians believe that Jesus Christ will return to earth in their lifetime. The book of Revelation contains Jesus Christ's last words to the Christian church about the future. He warns of the terrible events that will fall upon the earth during the tribulation. What will happen to Satan, to the Antichrist, and to all who follow false religion? He tells what will happen at the Battle of Armageddon, his second coming to earth, his millennial kingdom, the final judgment, and describes what God has planned for his people in eternity future. In this series, we will take you chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to help you understand its message and the future events God predicts are up ahead. My guests are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dean of Liberty University's School of Religion, and distinguished professor of religion and the author of over 40 books. Dr. Mark Hitchcock is associate professor of Bible exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's the author of 30 books on biblical prophecy and is the senior pastor of Faith Bible Church. Dr. Ron Rhodes also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and is president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministries. He's the author of 70 books on prophecy. Join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and I have three wonderful guests, as you've just heard, Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, and Dr. Ron Rhodes. And again, Ed, I would like for you to kind of summarize where we're at as we study the fabulous book of Revelation. This is exciting information that God himself gave to us. He said Jesus' last words to the church. And we're moving along here. Tell us where we're at. In chapter 1, the risen Christ appears to John on the island of Patmos, commissions him to write the book of the Revelation. Chapters 2 and 3, Jesus' letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor back on the coast. And then in chapter 4, the scene changed dramatically. Uh, after this, John said, I saw this open door in heaven, a voice of Jesus speaking to me saying, come up here and I'll show you what will be in the future, what will be hereafter. In that fourth chapter, John is caught up into the throne room of heaven and he tries to describe the indescribable. God the Father seated on the throne, a great glorious light, a shining emerald rainbow around the throne, a sea of glass in front of it. You sense the inaccessibility of God. How do you get to God? How do you get to the throne? How do you see His face? And the Bible tells us we come boldly to the throne uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the fourth chapter, all of heaven falls down and worships God the Father uh, as the creator of the universe. And then in chapter 5, the great problem is introduced. The seven-sealed scroll in the hand of God the Father, no one is found worthy to break the seals, read the message, uh, pronounce the judgments, and bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Uh, and then the problem is solved when the Lamb appears and all of heaven falls down and worships Jesus, the Lamb of God. Uh, the deity of Christ shouts to us from these chapters. Uh, the whole focus of Revelation is to call our attention to Him. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and what's coming up is a big problem in heaven that uh, the book of Revelation uh, tells us about. But before we talk about the big problem, what it is and how it's solved, there's one other thing we haven't mentioned, that there's 24 elders that show up in these first three, four chapters of of Revelation in different places down the line here. And there's a lot of debate about who these 24 elders sitting before the throne in their white robes, who they are. Ron, explain the different views and where are we settled? Well, one view is that they are angels. And that's been a popular view among some people, but that's not really a likely view because of the way they are described. For example, they're called elders. We find that humans are called elders, but we don't find in the Bible that angels are called elders. And as well, throughout the book of Revelation, we see that angels and the elders are actually distinguished. And so that means that the elders probably are not angels. And then third, there's a song of redemption in Revelation 5, 9, where, you know, it would be very natural for humans to be singing that song of redemption but unnatural for angels to be doing so because they were not a part of that. And so I don't think that they were angels. 
Other people have held that it's the church and Israel. The problem with that viewpoint, though, is that Israel will not be resurrected and rewarded uh, until the second coming of Christ, according to Daniel chapter 12. And that brings me to our view, which is that it's the church. 24 elders are representative of the church. And I say that for the following reason. When you look at the different rewards of the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we find that among those rewards is wearing a crown, sitting on a throne, and wearing a white robe. Well, the 24 elders are described in those very terms. And so I think very clearly this is representing the church. Now, here's the exciting thing about all of that. This is perfectly in sync with the pre-tribulational viewpoint, which says that the rapture takes place before the tribulation. You couldn't hold to this view in post-tribulationism, but in pre-tribulationism, it makes good sense. And as for why there are 24, well, 24 is representative of the entire body of Christ, the entire church. And we get that from 1 Chronicles 24, where we are told that there are 24 orders of priests. And of course, in the book of Revelation, we are called a kingdom of priests. So it fits together quite nicely. Yeah. And now, Mark, we get to some big stuff here, okay? We have, the Bible says, I saw, chapter 5, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, namely God himself, a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And then here's the big problem. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And John, realizing this, just starts crying like mad in heaven about there was nobody that, that seemed to be able to open the scroll. First of all, what is this scroll and the seven seals? You've done a lot of work on this. What is it? Well, this scroll was written on both sides, which makes it very important. Documents normally weren't written on both sides in that time. So it, whatever it is, it's important. It contains a lot of information. There's a lot of different views on, on the, the identity of the scroll. Uh, some people think it's uh, the book of the New Covenant. Some think it's uh, a book of redemption, the Lamb's book of life, the title deed to the earth, that it's a long list of judgments, so called like the doomsday scroll. Um, a record of the sins of man. There, there's, there's no loss of views on this. But when we look at documents at that time that were sealed with seven seals, the only document sealed with seven seals back at that time was a will or a testament. And so what this is, is it's the inheritance. It's a will. You go back to the Psalms. It says, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. So this contains literally the inheritance for this world. And the reason John is weeping here when the scroll is held in the right hand of the Father and there's no one found worthy to open it, he realizes that if this scroll isn't opened, that God's purposes for this world and for mankind will never be fulfilled because God's purpose is for His Messiah to come back and to rule over this earth. So when Jesus takes the scroll and He's found worthy to do it, all heaven really breaks out in celebration. And it's beautiful there because it says uh, that the one who is worthy to open this scroll, uh, the reason he's worthy is it says, for you were slain and you've redeemed us to God by your blood. And so Jesus, by his death, has come and paid the price for sin so that he now is qualified to take the inheritance. And what we have then through really the rest of the book of Revelation is the opening of this scroll. Chapter 6, we're going to see the, the seals begin to be opened. Then the seventh seal in chapter 8 is going to contain seven trumpets. And then in chapter 16, the, the seventh trumpet judgment contains these seven bowls. So when this scroll is finally opened, we have the glorious return of Jesus back to the earth in chapter 19 and the establishment of His kingdom, the fulfillment of these promises. He's going to receive the inheritance. Ed, I think we have to talk about this. The description of Jesus shows up here symbolically he's the lamb that was slain and he takes the scroll from the father and all of heaven starts singing he is worthy and we get worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing now why is it 
we ought to stop here. And if you're in a Bible study and you're, you're talking about this, what does this mean to us that Jesus is worthy to take the scroll? Because Jesus appears as the bloody lamb, uh, the lamb as though it had been slain. John looks up through tear-stained eyes and sees Christ seated in the throne, co-equal with God the Father. So this chapter is shouting to us of the deity of Christ. In chapter 4, uh, the angelic creatures like seraphim are shouting, Holy, 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 uh, thrice holy is the triune God. Uh, and in the Greek New Testament in which this was written originally, the word holy, uh, hagios, 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 and then the word worthy, axios. It's almost like a play on those two words. Uh, they even look alike in the Greek text. That which is worthy of our worship, our worship is that which is holy. Only someone who is a divine being is worthy to come and take the scroll, uh, open the seals and pronounce the judgments. Jesus is worthy of worship. And at the end of chapter five, all of heaven falls down and worships him as God the Redeemer. You cannot read Revelation 4 and 5 and miss the deity of Christ. It's literally leaping right off the pages. This is not an idea invented later in church history. No, this was all part of the whole New Testament message from the very beginning. He was God incarnate in human flesh, a sinless Savior who could die for our sins, who could rise from the dead, and ultimately is worthy to come and rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, we're talking about the fabulous events that God reveals to us in the book of Revelation. And you had said something very important before that we need to, to get into this program. And that is that Revelation goes back and forth between what's happening in heaven and then what happens on earth. What happens in heaven, what happens on earth. Talk about that. Well, yeah, the book of Revelation has this alternating pattern between scenes in heaven, scenes on earth. And you see this really beautifully illustrated in chapters four and five. And then when you go to chapter six, because chapters four and five, we have this beautiful uh, scene around the throne of God in heaven. God's on his throne. And it ends with this beautiful crescendo of worship. And then when we come to chapter six, we're down to the earth now. And we go from worship to warfare. But the thing with this alternating pattern between heaven and earth in the book is it shows constantly, it keeps taking us back to heaven to show us that God is on the throne. So it's showing us that what's happening here on earth is always being controlled by the throne of God in heaven, which is a great comfort to us in these times in which we live, these uncertain days. Even today, when we see things on earth we don't understand, we can know that those events are being controlled by God who's seated on his throne in heaven. All right, so Ron, let's open this first seal. What is it? The Bible says, and I looked and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. Uh, what else is it? Well, you know, a lot of people make an assumption that because he's riding a white horse, this must be, mean Jesus. Because in Revelation 19, we see that Jesus rides a white horse. But uh, that doesn't work with the context at all. In fact, the first four seal judgments involve the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And each of the four horsemen of the apocalypse are involved in judgments, judgments that unfold on planet Earth. As the first seal is open, the first rider on the horse does his thing. As the second seal is open, you have the second horseman of the apocalypse. All of them deal with judgment. So this individual is not Jesus, but is rather the Antichrist. And he comes forth conquering and to conquer. He has a bow without an arrow. It means that he hasn't started any war yet, but he's got the mil military power to do it if he so chooses. And that may relate to the fact that he's able to enforce a covenant on Israel and the Middle East. He's got that military power. Yeah, and so here we have the, going back to Daniel, you find the fact is that the, the Antichrist actually signs a covenant with Israel, a peace treaty that's supposed to last for all seven years. Right. But uh, before we pick up more on that, let's go to the second seal where after he goes out and he signs this and it seems like peace, the next thing we find out is that peace is taken from the earth and now we got war. What happens? Well, the very fact that peace is taken from the earth means that peace previously existed. So there was previously peace under the Antichrist, but now with the second horseman of the apocalypse at the second seal, peace is taken from the earth. And the text says, another horse, fiery red, indicating blood, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, 
and there was given to him a great sword. And of course, the implication is that that sword is doing its thing worldwide. So yeah, people all I, over the world. And what I want to ask is, does this where Ezekiel, the Ezekiel 38 war, the war that Ezekiel talked about, where a group of nations would gather together and they would come against Israel, is this the time that that happens? When does it happen? Well, it's possible. It's possible. And the Ezekiel invasion involves Russia, Iran, Sudan, Libya, Turkey, and a number of other Muslim nations moving against Israel. And if you can picture in your mind the tiny piece of real estate known as Israel, surrounded by millions of miles, square miles of real estate of Arab and Muslim nations, you can see that Israel has no chance. Now, when this invasion takes place, it is God who defends Israel and completely destroys the invaders. I think, John, too, what, what we get in here with the four horsemen of the apocalypse is kind of an overview of what's coming in the chapters that follow. Revelation has this kind of glance ahead, then the details, kind of the wide angle lens, then the snapshots. The Antichrist is coming, the white horse, war is coming, the red horse, famine is coming on the black horse, and death is coming with the pale rider. Yeah, take those last two. You've got the black horse. So I looked and behold a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine, which means that food costs have gone way up, okay? And yet uh, there's a, some people that are rich enough that hold on to that wine because they can still pay for it. So you got the rich, but the, m most of the world is poor and in famine and dying. Now take it from there. Well, the end result of war is always going to bring people into devastation. Right. And that leads to famine, that leads to death, and then you have this sad picture uh, of death and hell followed after him. It's almost like he pictures death coming along and picking up the corpse uh, and throwing him on the wagon, so to speak. He's cleaning up the mess afterwards. People are dying, and that's one of the tough things in the book of Revelation. Uh, people say, well, it scares me to read these things. Well, it's not written to scare us. It's written to prepare us. Be ready to meet Jesus uh, at any time. Uh, make sure you know that you're ready to go because you don't want to be left behind. It's only bad news for the unbelievers. It's good news for the believer. It's bad news for the unbeliever. Mark, fourth one follows what we're saying here. So I looked and behold, a pale horse on the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. Well, what does that mean? Well, it tells us there that there's just going to be massive death. In fact, it says there there's going to be one-fourth of the earth is going to die just in this one judgment. Now, we can kind of read over things like that rather quickly and just, you know, kind of read over that number. But that's a fourth of the people on the earth. You know, say there's, after the rapture, there's six billion people left or something like that. I mean, you're looking at, you know, almost one and a half billion people on the earth dying in one of these judgments. And we, we see the severity of this. And sometimes it's hard to get our minds around because, uh, you know, we, we see God as a God of love and a God of grace and mercy, which he is. But God is going to bring judgment on this earth, uh, unmitigated judgment. And it says they're going to be slain there by, uh, uh, by plagues. Uh, it says they're going to be slain by uh, uh, the sword. And it says by the wild beasts of the earth. And some people wonder what that means, the wild beasts. But primarily, the other times that word is used, wild beasts, it refers to, to powerful rulers on the earth. So probably by the actions of dictators and the Antichrist is called the beast. Probably through their actions, uh, you know, millions, billions of people literally will die on the face of the earth. Now we get into this fifth seal, which is the cry of the martyrs of people that, like you say, maybe you've got rulers that take it out on them. Maybe for some reason they say the rapture and the, what happened there that caused all this destruction. It was their fault and they go after, they kill them. For some reason in heaven we see, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony uh, which they held, and there are a ton of them, okay? And they're saying they want revenge. Ron, what's going on here? Well, massive numbers of believers will be uh, martyred, and notice that they're perfectly conscious in heaven. You know, their bodies are still on earth, but they're up in heaven talking to God. This kind of reminds me of the fact, John, that later on we're, to we're told about the false religion that's going to come about. And this false religion was drunk on the blood of the martyrs. 
So this false religion, whatever it is, is going to put true believers to death. You see, they're going to embrace everybody and be very eclectic and love everyone except true believers in Jesus Christ. So that definitely could relate to what we're talking about here if you're wondering who it is that's doing the murdering. You have something fabulous to say here, and that is that you say that uh, the book of Revelation is good news for Christians, and it's bad news for non-Christians because you don't want to be caught in this time of tribulation. Tell me why again. Well, because everything's going wrong. People are dying, armies are marching, the world is at war, God is releasing cosmic judgment on the world, and it's the depravity of the human heart. It's not a mean God, it's God saying, I'm taking my hand of protection off the world, and I'm going to allow the depravity of human beings to express itself. And we've seen glimpses of that in our own lifetime. Now, in this time of tribulation, that will be out of control. Now, that's no time to say, I'm just going to wait and be left behind and, and then I'll get saved. If you're not going to come to Christ now in a time of relative peace and prosperity, you're never going to come to Him if it's going to cost you your life. Uh, he's not worth dying for unless He's really worth living for in the first place. Yeah, how many people are going to be against the Christians at that time? The whole world, it sounds like, is turning against anybody that comes to faith. Now, that does raise a question we'll have to deal with yet, and that is, will anybody get saved during the time of the tribulation period? And we're going to talk about that, but finish this up here with the sixth seal. Yeah, the sixth seal is just going to really be when, when things begin to break loose on the earth. There's going to be a massive earthquake, uh, severe cosmic disturbances. People everywhere are going to try to hide, the Bible says, from the, the wrath of the one who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. So really everything's going to be coming unloosed. There's even going to be, uh, uh, um, the Bible says, stars of heaven falling to the earth. Now, it doesn't really literally mean the stars that are out there like Betelgeuse or, you know, or one of these, but it's talking about meteorites, meteor showers, things like that coming to the earth. So everything that people know uh, of the order that we see today in our world is really going to be breaking loose. People are going to be finding somewhere to hide during this time. It's a time of unparalleled judgment on the earth. All right, and the last verse in chapter 6 says, For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And on the basis of that verse, some people say, this is now, after that, the beginning of the tribulation. And uh, the first seals here, these were all caused by Satan. These were not from God. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Well, yeah, a lot of people, it's called the pre-wrath view of the rapture. They say the rapture happens right there at the sixth seal because that's when the wrath of God starts, and that's what believers are promised we're exempt from. The, the difficulty with that view from my perspective, it's Jesus, though, the Lamb, that's opening all of those seals. So certainly the, the uh, judgments in the tribulation get closer together, and they escalate in their intensity throughout the tribulation. We all agree with that. But Jesus is the one who's opening these seals. And so even the first four seals, the fifth seal, these are all the wrath of God in the sense that He's the one who's opening these. And though they're become more directly uh, the wrath of God as we go on, it doesn't eliminate the fact these are the wrath of God that are being unleashed. And if we are exempt from the wrath from this time of testing that's coming upon the whole earth, then that means we have to be raptured or caught up before the tribulation begins. Uh, but before the entire seven-year period starts. Yeah. All right, next week, stick with us. We're going to talk about what God is going to be doing in the midst of all this turmoil that He is causing, basically, the judgments that are coming from God on the earth. God is still merciful, and He brings in 144,000 witnesses, special people that He picks out to proclaim the gospel. We're going to talk about who these people are, what they do, what power God gives them, and what happens, all right? We'll start with that next week. I hope that you'll join us. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, The Last Words of Jesus, The Book of Revelation, our nine television programs are available on three DVDs. Our first DVD covers Revelation 1 through 6, and is titled, The Glorified Jesus Reveals the Future. Our guests describe Jesus' appearance to John and his commission to him to write the book of Revelation. John then writes letters to the seven churches and is taken up to the throne room of God 
where he sees Jesus open seven seals that rain down different judgments on earth. Our second DVD contains three more programs that cover chapters 7 through 13, which we have titled, The Judgments and Main Players of the Tribulation. Here, we learn about the seven trumpet judgments. As a result of the seal and trumpet judgments, half of the world's population will die. We'll then discover the main players in the tribulation, including a woman, a child, and a dragon who symbolize Israel, Jesus, and Satan. We are told about the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, and 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Our third DVD is entitled Armageddon, the Second Coming and Eternity Future and covers Revelation chapters 14 through 22. Here we learn about the seven horrible bowl judgments and the battle of Armageddon. Jesus will defeat his enemies at his second coming and set up his millennial kingdom on earth. This will be followed by God's final judgment and a description of the new heaven and earth for believers. Today, you may order our entire series on Revelation containing all nine television programs for $110. With this series, we are going to include our 168-page book of Revelation study guide. This new study guide includes extensive notes that parallel our television programs with nine sessions for your personal study or Bible study group. If you'd like to have five or more study guides, they are available for $8 each. Finally, I taped a one-hour question and answer session with our scholars discussing the rapture, the identity of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the coming global government, and much, much more. You may obtain this DVD for a gift of $20. And if you'd like to have all of these materials together, including all nine DVD programs, our new 168-page study guide, plus the one-hour question and answer session, they are available together in a special package for only $125. You may order the special package now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. We may also order these materials at jashow.org.